Welcome to our event today. My name is Jessica Main, and I'm a faculty member at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Asian Studies. I'm joining you today from my home office. Our guest, uh, Dr. Kinchun George Lee, and I will be speaking in English with English captions available. It's also possible to listen to simultaneous interpretation in either Cantonese or Mandarin if you choose. And you can do this by pressing the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. It's the one that looks like a wireframe globe. So please press this button if you'd like options for simultaneous translation, uh, simultaneous interpretation in either Cantonese or Mandarin. For those listening or reading the captions, I'm a middle-aged white and woman presenting the Asian Center is actually behind me, the uh, Japanese peace bell uh, depicted on my background with blossoms in spring. I teach courses on Buddhism and I research modern Japanese Pure Land Buddhism and social ethics. I have the privilege to direct UBC's Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation Program in Buddhism and Contemporary Society. The program in Buddhism and Contemporary Society is homed at UBC's Point Grey campus, which is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and occupied territory of the Hunkaniam speaking Musqueam peoples. Musqueam peoples are currently engaged in struggles for decolonization, for sovereignty, and for revitalization of language and culture. This land has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam people, who for millennia have passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next. Today, we gather virtually from many places, whether from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tholo, and Tsleil-Waututh of the Vancouver area, or the lands of other indigenous peoples from around the world. And we do so to learn from one another. I invite you to do whatever it is that lets you attend to the needs of your body and your mind and to be as present as possible. That may include things like eating and drinking, lying down, uh, making your body comfortable. We are uh, joined by scholar, author, and counselor, Dr. George Lee, who has generously agreed to answer questions uh, about and discuss his brand new book. The Guide to Buddhist Counseling, published this year by Rutledge. I'm just going to place into the chat uh, to everyone the site that gives information about our webinar tonight. If you've registered, you'll receive uh, word if a recording becomes available uh, later on. The book, uh, the cover of which, the illustration for the cover, you can see behind uh, Dr. Lee, uh, that's his background. This book is available for purchase via Amazon. As well, uh, the author has generously bought a few hard copies, uh, which will be available for purchase at the Tongling Kokyuan Canada Society Temple. And you could purchase a copy, go down to the TLKY Temple to pick it up, and join in a series of events. Uh, tonight's uh, discussion is launching a series of events on the theme of Buddhism, well-being, counseling, chaplaincy, and uh, engaging with people where they're at in a variety of ways. If you're interested, I'm going to place a link into the chat, which gives you more information about events which will be occurring over the next three days. For example, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Lee will be hosting two workshop sessions on Buddhist counseling. On Saturday morning, Dr. Lee, Dr. Ernest Ung, who is generously interpreting our uh, session tonight in Cantonese, and Venerable Dr. Uh, Hin Yan Sik, will be addressing Buddhist counseling, chaplaincy, and the search for peace in turbulent times. And then Venerable Hin Yang will be leading sessions on hospital chaplaincy and Buddhist spiritual care this Sunday. So if there's lots going on, uh, please feel welcome to join us at the TLKY Canada Society Temple. And that's located on Victoria and Broadway uh, near the SkyTrain station. 
let me tell you a little bit about our author before I invite him to take uh, center stage and respond to questions from me and from you. Please know that you have the chat as well as the Q&A function to type questions in, which I will gather together and ask our author. Ken Chung George Lee is a lecturer in the Center of Buddhist Studies at the University of Hong Kong. As well, he is a licensed psychologist in the state of California. He was previously the Director of Clinical Training at the California School of Professional Psychology, Hong Kong campus, and the Assistant Chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of the West. At the University of Hong Kong, he is a founding member of the Master of Buddhist Counseling Program, as well as the Postgraduate Diploma in Professional Practice uh, of Buddhist Counseling. He has published a number of academic articles in the areas of Buddhist mindfulness, Buddhist counseling, acculturation, and family conflicts, and international student psychology. His primary research focus, which is what we're all about tonight, is the integration of early Buddhist teaching into a theoretical orientation for mental health treatment, which he calls the note, no, choose model. And we'll be coming back to that, I assume, several times this evening. And uh, this model is described in his new book, The Guide to Buddhist Counseling. So, uh, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is my pleasure to be your interlocutor and to ask questions about your new book. Uh, I'd like to begin on that note with a uh, open-ended question about how you got to the book itself. Could you speak a little bit about your experiences and motivations, things that brought you to write this book, reasons why you wanted to write this book? How, for example, did you become both a psychologist and uh, an educator in Buddhist studies. Thank you very much, Dr. Ming. It is my honor to receive this interview from UBC and Tony Cook in Canada Society to talk about Buddhist counseling and also to talk about my book. This is such a great question. You know, um, well, now I'm getting old, but thinking about your question makes me feel young again. When I was an undergraduate student, I was actually in the United States studying psychology. At that time, I was only 18 years old. I was uh, really fascinated by all the new theories about human personality, about human motivation, about psychopathology, why we have mutual illness, uh, what can we do to feel better, all those kind of great things. But soon I realized one common pattern, all those kind of great theories, research, even philosophy were mainly based on uh, Western culture. And I was very curious, is there any wisdom uh, from the East? Is there anything that maybe the school of thought, the theory, or that kind of uh, psychological um, understanding of human being can be rooted from Eastern culture so that when we apply it to understand human behaviors, human motivation, it can be more congruent to uh, the rest of the world. Disappointedly, I didn't find any. Um, and time flies. I was trained as first as a family therapist. And at that time, most of the psychological schools talk about multiculturalism, which is we use some theories developed in a Western culture while like we try to be as best as we can to be sensitive to different cultural neurons, background factors of different people, uh, Asian cultures, African-American, Latino, Latino, or many different cultures. While that question come back again strongly of if we are going to take something and fit it to something different, can we do it the other way? Can we find something within that culture? And I believe for all cultures, there are some 
very good wisdom embedded in our own ancestor heritage. But the question or the problem is sometimes in a contemporary society, we may not know how to appreciate our own cultural roots. And later, when I become a assistant professor in psychology, I had the privilege to work at a place called University of the West, which was founded by Grandmaster Xin Yun from Foguang San. And in that place, it was the first official time that I got in touch with Buddhism. And I was fascinated. I quickly made a decision that I should switch club. I should jump from psychology to Buddhism. I should stop acting like a clinical psychologist, know everything, and quickly admit my ignorance to many sides of human nature and becoming a student in Buddhism, uh, hopefully with fresh eyes. And that journey still continue. Uh, now I'm doing my second PhD in Buddhist studies, first one in clinical psychology, second one in Buddhist studies. And my goal is to integrate the two and hopefully create another way, another choice of psychotherapy that can resonate with certain people that like, interested in, or affiliate with Buddhism. And the book that I just get published, in a way, this is the, to mark in that stage for the best I can do because there's so many things that actually I don't know I'm still learning. But for the best I can do at this stage, I hope to capture it almost like a journal to signify what I'm able to articulate, what might be a good functional way to integrate Buddhism and counseling so that it set an example for people who are much more intelligent than I am, who are much more compassionate or motivated than I am to know that, ah, if George can do something, maybe I can do, I can use my own cultural uh, philosophy, theory, to integrate something with a counseling model so that I can benefit people who resonate with that. Hopefully with that seeds, with that uh, inspirations and that humility that I can um, invite more people to do similar things so that collectively we can reduce more suffering in the world. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, it's interesting to hear that the start of your journey was in clinical psychology, and that uh, through an opportunity to teach students at the University of the West, um, as you mentioned, the Po Guangshan uh, sponsored uh, but fully accredited uh, university. It's one of the universities in the United States that trains Buddhist chaplains as yes. well. Uh, it, it is wonderful to hear that that coming together of your work and uh, this particular institution uh, started you on the road to think about Buddhist studies. I uh, ended up doing Buddhist studies as my own uh, degree, but I worked more on uh, East Asia, on uh, mm -hmm. Japan. And it makes me uh, wonder one thing that I hit very early in your book so I figure this is a good chance to do that now, is you mentioned cultural background and wanting to find a uh, practice that involves both um, behaviors, beliefs, uh, worldviews, that isn't just sort of picked up and fit into a scientific, for example, we'll come back to science, I'm sure, uh, a scientific uh, model without due consideration to how that exists as a complex thing that works. So the question is this, why early Buddhism? Why not Chinese Mahayana Buddhism? Why not Pure Land Buddhism? And as a scholar of Pure Land, I always have to ask. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Very important question. You know, this journey, it looks nice. I, I am a, a, the team that I work with. We are able to do a lot of things. But in fact, what people see 
are the shining, the product of all the hard work. But in the middle, we have a lot of struggles. For example, doing Buddhist counseling, people from more traditional psychology or counseling, they may say, what are you doing? We are good enough. Why do you do something that is uh, so new that may not work? And I don't know what you're doing. Don't say that you are affiliated with us. Like part of the people said something like that. And very traditional Buddhist scholars, some of them would be more into textual studies, philosophical debate, arguments, and don't see the value of application. So the reason why we still do something like that is because I think first, I think in every uh, period of time, in response to suffering, our human mind, perhaps our Buddha nature, we collectively try to come up with certain kind of response in order to help with our own suffering. In this time, psychotherapy and counseling, the way of communication, the way of talking to a counselor, certain kind of communication skills, I think in a contemporary world, I mean, regardless of the culture, part of them is quite relevant in the whole world. Talking to a counselor, psychotherapist nowadays, I think is not something very novel and familiar with and reasonably well accepted in many different cultures. But then it's about the theory itself, why Buddhism and why in Buddhism early Buddhist teachings. In order to avoid uh, uh, more challenges, I pick early Buddhist teachings because I believe that early Buddhist teachings will be the teachings that is the most congruent to different kind of school because supposedly, I mean, like in any kind of discussion or debate, we have to have some philosophical given. The philosophical given that I take is that early Buddhist teachings is the closest to what the Buddha originally taught. So hopefully using that as a starting point, it can skip some of the debates and really think about the application, the practicality, how can we use that? And secondly, uh, supposedly, if we believe in all the history, all the documentations, the Buddha, and then we have the early Buddhist teachings, and then we have like many things like the commentaries, uh, Theravada and Mahayana and all that, to contemporary American Buddhism and all that. So if I'm able to start with the early Buddhist teaching, that set an example for what can be done in all the different schools. So early Buddhist teachings, I really like, part of that I really like the simplicity, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, dependent origination or dependent co-arising, all those kind of like main concepts are all there and have a very significant position. And when we apply that to counseling, I think it fits with a very core foundation to have a strong backbone. And any other interpretation or involvement in Buddhism, I think they have a lot of potentials to add different layers, different skillful means to the model and make it more tailor-made for a specific population. Uh, and other thing that I think is very personal, I think early Buddhist teaching resonated more with me, especially how uh, focusing on our hardship, I do think even though the Buddhist of a path is great, but at the same time, we need to cultivate our wisdom, our own uh, dispassion, uh, working with our own hindrances and defilements so that when we become compassionate to other people, it's not a self-driven or self-centered kind of compassion. It can be more selfless compassion with wisdom. So there are many layers that I like about early Buddhist teachings. So hopefully it's just a beginning point for many other, many other uh, inspiring Buddhist counseling model that one day someone choose to go to see a counselor or psychotherapist instead of thinking, do I do CBT? Do I do psychoanalysis? Or do I do Buddhist counseling? So this is a long vision that I have. So your answer starts to uh, get to some of the issues that you address in the early chapters of your book, because it's clear that uh, in your interactions with clinical psychology, 
and your interactions with uh, Buddhist practitioners as well as clients, that you have been getting some of these challenges. And one you mentioned was the idea that Buddhism is brand new uh, or <laughs> applying Buddhism to the mind is somehow brand new. And uh, the choice, for example, of early Buddhism in that way uh, is quite interesting. So thank you for that. Um, when you are responding to other kinds of challenges, for example, not so much that applying Buddhism to the mind is new per se, but rather that Buddhism is a religion. And this is a question that you um, take up right from the start of your book. If a religion doesn't fit so nicely into a psychotherapeutic or counseling practice, how do you define religion? What is the religious elements of Buddhism that are important, but not so useful for this particular purpose? I would try to answer very carefully as I am not per se a scholar in religious studies. But from my understanding of the term religion, it can have many different definitions. For example, if we look at the Latin root, religion doesn't actually mean the religion nowadays. It may be more like, like you know a lot more than me, like um, conscientiousness or something more about virtue instead of believing in something. But taking like me as a civilian, taking a more uh, mundane approach to understand religion, I see that more as a belief. And that belief usually is related to a higher power, more mystic kind of things. Um, usually it involves worships or other kind of more spiritual practices with that, which actually is, is not any problem. And for me, uh, as a Buddhist, I also take Buddhism as a religion. For example, I have a Avalo Kilishvara or Guan Yin statue at home. I worship every day before I go to work. But when it puts into a psychotherapy model, in our development of psychology nowadays, we try to make things more secular or non-faith based so that we can avoid coercing, forcing our own religious belief to clients. So when, I, uh, when people talk about Buddhism as religion, from my personal experiences, from some experiences from clients or even some scholars, the first reaction can be like, wow, it's a religion. So do I have to believe in something? Do I need to worship a Buddha, a Bodhisattva? Do I need to take vows as a Buddhist? Or is it scientific? Is it something that is reliable? Or just some lay cultural belief that may not work? So, of course, like we as scholars, we can have all those kind of uh, debates or explanations about those things. But being influenced by early Buddhist teaching, the most important thing is not to ask about whether the cosmos is finite or infinite, right? It's not about when you're being stabbed by arrow. It's not about asking, oh, where does it made of? Uh, Germany or China? Where does the poison come from? Those kind of things. It's all about using a skillful way to liberate from suffering as soon as you can. So if nowadays in a contemporary culture, religion somehow has a connotation of a more like supernatural, superhuman belief that not everyone buy, or some people, as long as they think it's related to religion, they don't want to try a certain way of counseling. So my definition of Buddhism is more about psychology. And to be honest, I think most of the early Buddhist teachings, if not all, is talking about human mind, sometimes human body, sometimes like human nature, social behaviors and all that. But one big emphasis is on human mind, which is the same as in psychology. Buddhism, early Buddhist teaching from my understanding is about how can we work effectively to liberate from suffering? And this is the main goal. And because we all suffer, 
And that's why we all can try different ways to suffer less and ultimately liberate from that. And this is a very important meaning in life. And that simplicity, that very direct goal to answer the earlier question is another thing that I like about early Buddhist teaching. So that's why when I talk about this model in my writing, in my presentations, in my teaching, it's more about can we see the wisdom, the, the beauty of the theory, and do not just blindly having faith in something, just like the two the Kalamist Sutta, is always about, yes, you can learn, you can hear, you can listen, all the great things that all the philosophers, all the research, all the science have to say, but it doesn't really help unless you have a direct experience to contemplate, to try. And the Buddha basically said, you don't just believe in everything I say, you need to experience it yourself. And in a Buddhist counseling model, it doesn't really just focus on uh, a religious component. I think it's easier to convince people that it is, after all, your own experience that matters. But of course, a very important caveat is that in Buddhist counseling, there are many different people practicing different types of Buddhist counseling or Buddhist psychotherapy. It's always possible to use a religious component, chanting, worshipping, or different ways as a skillful means. For me, the ethical consideration would always be what is actually resonating the most with the client's worldview, because we are trying to help them within their five aggregates, within their story of the I, within their conceptual proliferations, instead of forcing them or like taking out their mind to change something. It's not possible because we are all limited by our own five aggregates. As long as we are able to attune with them, understand their story, their suffering, then this is a skillful mean. How can we tailor made the most specific method to talk to them, to listen to them, to do things to intervene so that at that situation, in that moment, in that particular injurious or defilement, they can gain a little bit more insight. They can see things, see the world with a little bit more right view. They can ease a little bit of their attachment or clinging so that they have less suffering. Bit by bit, bit by bit, then our Buddha nature will do the thing, accumulating the wisdom, and we can advise step by step towards the liberation from suffering. Of course, there's a long way. It requires a lot more devoted practices, guidance, and all that. But at least if we come back to just one moment, this is what we need to do. Thank you so much for those reflections. There are lots of uh, interesting threads that we could follow from uh, your uh, answer. One of these is the idea that uh, clients have worldviews, that Buddhism has worldviews, and that psychology and science has worldviews. You mentioned that a skillful counselor doesn't uh, force or is sensitive, attuned to the worldview of their client. Now, my question is going to back up a bit uh, and come back to this idea of the client uh, and ask some more questions about uh, cool Buddhist concepts such as the five aggregates and the unanswerable questions and lots of fun things. But first, thinking about science and this early Buddhist theoretical orientation, what are some of the differences between the worldview of what you're looking at as Buddhist counseling based on early Buddhist uh, ideas and practices and the scientific worldview? that is, uh, works its way through the practice and the beliefs and the uh, complex that is psychology. From my understanding of science, it's quite a lot about understanding, measuring, demonstrating certain kind of objective reality. Um, in science, there are many different aspects, but in social science, one of the famous psychotherapy model, counseling model is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. 
in CBT, one of the assumptions is that if we can help client to see the world, see themselves and other people more realistically, they would actually suffer less. Which sounds to be, aha, isn't that Buddhism can be like that too? Yes, but the definition of reality can be pretty different. So CBT as a social scientific model of psychotherapy, reality can be pretty objective in a way that you use your subjective way to view the objective world and try to be decrease the subjectivity and use objectivity to convince yourself what is actually right or more functional. Functional is the key word. Just now, I said something that no one can understand. So I'll give an example. Some people, they are very competent objectively. They may have a lot of achievements. They may uh, make a lot of money or have very high prestige in a society. That's in a mundane objective reality. But subjectively, they actually think really low, really incompetent of themselves. One reason, big reason in psychology is early childhood experiences, how they fail to meet their parents' expectations. From their parents' perspective, those are pretty subjective, right? But from their parents' perspective, this child is never good enough. So the child, from the social emotional learning, from the role modeling, from the interaction with the parents, is being convinced that I am not good enough. So they negate all the objective facts of the ability and accomplishment and insist on their core belief that I am not doing well. I cannot do it. So a CBT way would be to have a so-called reality, reality check to see objectively how you are like from most of the people's perspective or interpretation. Using that so-called objective other people's perspective, sometimes CBT can be very number-oriented. When 70% of the people evaluate you, George, as competent, and only 30% of people don't think you are competent, are you willing to see what the majority said and believe that you are more competent than how you define yourself in your core belief? Something like that. We call that a reality check. And in the cognitive processes, in changing the mind, is called cognitive restructuring. And supposedly, when people are able to use that more scientific way, which is an observable, specific measure of evidences to prove whether something is real, functional, or not, and believe in a new belief, like something like that. So that would be uh, one way to see the CBT reality. But in Buddhism, I do think mundanely that kind of makes sense. But if we want to believe in a super mundane or more ultimate way of practice, that would be a reality, for example, of dependent origination or dependent co-arising. Paticca samu pada. In the world, all the things that we see are all based on different forces and conditions. Forces and conditions can change, including who we are, our life, our loved ones. So that's why it's impermanent. That's one of the kind of uh, oversimplified way to talk about dependent origination. And in the two reality, in social science, at least, and in Buddhism, one of the main difference that I see is in social science, even though we talk about how we try to be more objective, basically, there's not any challenge about the existence of self, the existence of I. This is I. I have this core belief. I can look at objective factors to challenge my core belief so that I can be more functional, suffering less. While in Buddhism, boldly, directly, the Buddha taught about one main cause of suffering, 
is how we cling or attach onto the notion of self. This is a complicated concept. We are not saying that the self does not exist because provisionally we do have this five aggregates, this body, certain kind of uh, so-called existence that we feel, we talk. That's why we can be joined in this afternoon to talk about this topic. But the thing is, our human mind, we are inclined to believe in a self that is permanent, that is blissful, that is in, independent. Uh, for example, uh, this book is being published from a perspective of a self is, I did it all by myself. I'm good. I'm competent. You guys should buy my book. You guys should like that because this is good. Something like that on and on to use factors to prove that I exist, I am important, I'm good, very egocentric, lots of that about feeding the desire of our ego to self-convince that I exist in a certain form, certain way, independently, permanently. That is actually a main cause of suffering. In social science, it might not be a big problem as long as helpful and functional. <clears throat> But in Buddhism, we know that we're believing in something that doesn't exist quite that way. So when we rigidly define our self-notion to a certain way, to self-convince and self-satisfied as our existence is very costly. We are putting ourselves to a lot of disappointment in the reality. Like, no one actually buy my book or it's not that good, or oh, there are some typos or like some misalignment, which is actually true. That would be a big hit to the egoistic needs and make me suffer. So that's why under the world, under the reality of so-called dependent core arising, we understand that non-self and nata is another way to define our existence. We provisionally may feel or experience a certain way that feels like existence, but this kind of existence is just based on different conditions, different things. I do not have to define myself in a certain way, but it's okay. I can let go to be George, the person that have to try so hard to convince other people that I'm competent, and it's okay. We can exist, so-called exist, in a way that is more flexible, more joyful, with some mental distance, and that kind of more freely, professionally existent can reduce a lot of suffering because we no longer have to care so much about what our mindset, what the sense of self have been saying. We can be really enjoying the things that we have in the present moment. At least mundanely, that is a very good practice that can live a reasonably happy life. <laughs> so a really long answer to your question. It's just a very rejuvenating question. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is wonderful. It leads so naturally into uh, the next uh, topic that I hope to ask you about, which is uh, you've done this wonderful comparison of science CBT worldview with a concrete example, and then compared it to a uh, different kind of worldview and a different understanding of the self as being composite, composed of, as the Pali says, five aggregates, as being not a body and a mind dualistically separated where the, the mind somehow accesses our permanent self and that this continues through time. Shifting a little bit, continuing on with your example of how someone re-understands or understands their existence differently in a Buddhist counseling model, can you speak more about the model itself? the note, know, and choose model. For example, how do you go from mindfulness to this very plain and straightforward uh, intervention for your clients? Yes. Uh, to answer that question, I would like to ask all the participants one question. 
how many of you are aware of the way that you have been sitting in the last 30 minutes? You can tell, oh, wow, that you are very mindful. Most of the time when I ask this question, people will shift the way that they sit or stretch a little bit. Very few mindful people like Dr. Ming, who is able to be aware. <laughs> Just that flash of seconds, it was actually a process of note, no shoes. Noting means that when I ask the guiding question, are you aware of your body? Basically, just like in a Satipatthana practice, starting from the body, coming back to our body, we try to focus on how we position ourselves, where our tension is, or like where is the tightness. When we try to come back to our body, it means noting all the sensation experiences in the body. No is, conceptually, we understand the way that I see it, maybe like that or like that. Wow, that position actually hurts me. At first it was okay, but sitting too long, it was not comfortable. So consciously, I choose to change a posture or to stretch so that I sit more comfortably. Just that minor seconds, simple exercise is the essence of note, no choose. Noting means that we are raising awareness. We are starting to come back to the present moment to recenter our mind. Another thing about noting or mindfulness is we need to train our mind, be more sustainably stable clear, hopefully more peaceful. When we are able to cultivate a stronger capacity of our mind, we can use it to observe. Noting means observing. When we are able to observe, the next phase is knowing. Knowing will be parallel to wisdom. How can we raise more awareness and insights into what has been causing our suffering? Just now, easy example was the way that I was sitting caused me suffering. But that knowing can go very, very deep. It can be as simple as, ah, the way that I breathe. When I'm anxious, maybe I have a different way of breathing. If I consciously change the way of breathing, or if I consciously notice that when I'm anxious, when I'm nervous, my shoulders are really tight, if I just do a mindful stretching, my anxiety level actually decreased by 10%. Those are by knowing. But when the knowing deepens itself, it can do certain kind of deconstructions, such as, ha, huh, now I know that the reason why I try so hard to please my boss is because my boss reminds me of my father that I was never able to please. And psychologically, I thought that pleasing my boss, getting his approval can make me feel that I can be validated by a father. That's another deeper way of knowing. And even deeper knowing, we can train ourselves to observe the function of the mind. How do we actually respond to all the things in life? As mild, as small as Taking a breath, that's a pleasant sensation. But why? How do I know it's present? How do I know it's a good feeling? It's the mind's function that we don't see any gap in between. When we take a breath, automatically we feel pleasant. But we are not aware of how our mind actually made certain kind of interpretation. When we have a gap and slow down moments by moments, then we can see Ah, I do again. This is my automatic response to certain things. This is how my mind wants something or resists something. Every time when we know and then we know, it gives us a potentiality, a new little space 
or new little emptiness to make a different choice. Well, easy example just now, different way of sitting. Now I see and I know this way of sitting is not comfortable, so I choose consciously a different position of sitting. I see and I know the way that I please my boss, and I really rely on his evaluation of me to be to have a happy day or to have a miserable day. This is something that brings me a lot of suffering, and I don't want it. So I choose to change or not care so much or change a way of thinking. Or when I have that kind of response, I can soothe myself, have compassion for myself, or distract myself. So, or in daily life, I know that we have suffered a lot with our stress, with society, with different things. I consciously choose to be more sensitive to happiness, to cultivate more unconditional happiness, being happy with a simple meal, being happy with a simple breath, seeing the sun, being healthy, those kind of things. So bit by bit, every time when we note something, we know how suffering arises and know the components of how suffering is being sustained by our choices. We automatically see if I continue to do that, it will only bring me more suffering. So I consciously make a decision to do something more wholesome, more skillful. The good news is that every time when it go around and around like that, we are training our mind to be more skillful. And the next time, similar problem come automatically we are more prepared and we can be inclined to make a better decision it's the same rationale as going to a gym um i don't know if anyone have experience of like lifting up the weight well you may see that this five aggregate this ripper that's this body is a nerdy skinny asian body and you're right basically yes it is like that so when I have to lift a weight, it's very difficult. Every time when you persevere through, the next time will be easier. Every time you did it, next time will be easier. Same thing as mind training. Gym is training your muscles. Mind training is a mind gym. You train your mind to be more skillful. So the next time, you will find it easier again and again. So this is the no, no choose. It can happen in a moment. It can be expanded to understand relational issues, for example. It can be applied when you're doing meditation to know what is going on and consciously choose what to focus on. And the trick is, is go round and round and hopefully every round, we are bringing ourselves to a more skillful, more wholesome habits and stop certain kind of unskillful habits from happening again. Thank you again. Uh, I see that we have uh, a question in the chat, which uh, is pretty close to what we're talking about. So I'd like to introduce it here. Uh, Rachel Mio asks, in CBT, uh, if she understands you correctly, you are still relying on external sources on the objective world to validate yourself. So you're relying on the objective reality to change how you feel about yourself? This is a good question. Uh, I have to say, I'm old, and the CPT training that I got was basically before what we call the third wave CPT. So when I was young, when I learned CPT, it was more inclined toward that direction to use more external resources, not exactly to validate yourself, but then to examine, to investigate how you are like uh there are situations that objectively or from the external sources we are problematic i uh supervised a case a client who is a great young man uh, working as a logistic worker living in a halfway house which is after being released from psych psychiatric ward transitional place that they live with a group and later he can progress into a regular living situation and i would say he is the most popular 
so-called functional, less symptomatic client in the halfway house, and everyone just adores him. But the fact is, he struggled a lot, a lot of early traumas. Gambling mother, highly rejecting, criticizing father, who described him as less worthy than their dog at home. Early psychosis, uh, prodromal phase, early 20s, when he was uh, just going to be independent and don't need to carry on the parent's package. Schizophrenia came in. Long time struggles. And the thing is, he always wants to be a so-called normal person and doesn't want to affiliate with the fact that he has schizophrenia. External source is he has schizophrenia. And part of it is very brutal, no matter what he does. He is still less privileged than most of the people he saw. So part of the CBT is not a super quote or just find uh, pleasing resources or sources to convince him that he's okay, he's fine, he's competent. Part of the CPT is actually having that radical acceptance. Of course, with the help, with a company, with guidance of a counselor, with acceptance, with compassion, with unconditional positive regard to help the client truly accept Yes, this is how I am. I have schizophrenia. I wish that I can be like other people, but there are just limitations that I cannot. And it is okay. As long as I accept, here is where I am. Every day after that, I'm building more to what I can be. Instead of using, devoting all the energy to denying who I am. Well, that would be a more CBD answer with a little bit of Buddhist taste. But nowadays, my understanding of the third wave CBD, they added in a lot more Buddhist components, especially later forms of CBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Those two are closely related to Buddhism, of course, depending on who is the trainer or psychologist, they have different perspective. But from my perspective, they are closer to Buddhism. Their definition of self has been less rigid than what traditional psychology have talked about. But still, no one would say non-self. No one would boldly, bluntly say, ah, notion of self is a delusion. No one would, no one would say something like that. So if we walk from there to Buddhism, it adds a new taste or new practices on are there any ways we can examine and perhaps lessen our attachment to the self-notion. It's just hopefully bringing a bridge between CBT to progressing into Buddhist counseling. But uh, in the practice of Buddhist counseling, another more important thing is, I don't know whether Rachel's question is hinting to that, which is, I think, Practices, Buddhist practices, is a very private thing. A lot of times we need to rely on ourselves to cultivate our mind, to reflect and contemplate, to practice. Of course, at the same time, we need Buddhist counseling or like our devoted practice. We need guidance from, from masters because it's easy that we get stuck in certain level. But the essence is that the component of our own commitment, our own practice is very important. Compared to traditional psychotherapy, yes, it's not that it's not important. It can be important, but a lot of times it relies on the interaction with the counselor and in the dialogue or in the insight. It's rare, it's very rare that your psychologist will ask you to go home to have a devoted practice. So from now on, every day you need to do a, a 20 minutes of meditation and each week you have different sets of meditation. Well, usually they may have some homework for your reflections, but it's more linked to the external world. Internal cultivation will be a pretty Buddhist thing, which is, I think, can be a special um, 
privilege in Buddhist counseling. Thank you. Um, Rachel has uh, posted a quick follow-up, which is, uh, are you suggesting that a Buddhist counseling model, uh, different from CBT, would move the discovery more from, I'm assuming, intrinsic or inner, uh, perhaps uh, very close to what you were just describing? Let me see if I can answer that from another way. One assumption that I understand from early Buddhist teaching is that we are all trapped in our five aggregates. We basically don't have a direct understanding of the external world. Everything is filtered. Uh, I don't know, Rachel, do you think there is color in the world? You may think, of course there are color, but if there's no light, is there any color? If there's no eyeball, no retina, is there color? If there are no neurotransmitters, no uh, different uh, cerebral functions or loops in your brain, or the, no concepts of color, there won't be color. Which means that all the things that we see, all the things that we experience, in a way, you can argue, is all intrinsic. Nothing is totally external. We don't deny an external reality. We just don't know what it is. There is a stone, there is a table, there is a chair, but without all the concepts, without all the conditions, we just don't know what it is. So I think I want to expand on the intrinsic understanding. It's not about what is actually outside. It is about how does our mind react to all the things that we think that are outside and gain insight and realize, ah, this is how the mind works. This is how my body and mind work and examine to see, is that skillful? Does that make bring me more suffering? It's not. Is there any way to have a gap to see that and not react to that and bit by bit so that our mind can automatically be more skillful and bring us less suffering. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for your follow-up, Rachel. Uh, looking at our uh, Q&A, we also have a question from Louise. She writes, as a Buddhist, I believe that Buddhist counseling will help a lot of people and wish to praise George on his work. However, I wonder what happens if your client is not a Buddhist, or if he, she, they has other religious beliefs? What happens then? Wow, very good question, Louis. First of all, thank you for your compliment. And my answer can be different from many other people, but I will try to give you my answer. As I see Buddhism more as a psychology, which means that it's certain kind of logic, certain kind of worldview that can help people suffer less. The essence is not the contents of the belief, but certain kind of practices or certain kind of way that we reach conclusion can be what leads to suffering. Let me give you a real example. In the University of Hong Kong, because we need to survive in a university so that we need to do scientific research to prove to the scientific people that it works, give us more funding and money so that George can feed his family, and continue Buddhist counseling journey, something like that, right? I, I know that Professor Ming may, may share some of the feeling like that. So one of the research that we did, pretty interesting is that we study religious chanting. Um, uh, of course, I'm not chanting. I'm just saying that Omitofo, Abhitabha would be one of the way that people chant. So we do a study that have an intervention group and we have a control group. Both groups are being exposed to horror images, something that scare you, something that frighten you, and supposed to make you uncomfortable. And for the measurement, we hook up EEG brain scan to the participants and see how do they react when they see scary images. For the intervention group, we invite them. When they see those images, they will do their chanting. Uh, 
And in a control group, we invite them when we when they see the scary image, they will chant Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Santa Claus. Supposedly, people chanting Santa Claus should not induce any therapeutic or calming effect. Usually, I don't know for kids, but usually for adults, it doesn't really help. Research shows that in that new scientific study, both groups, when they're exposed to scary images, their amygdala is activated. Their EEG go like flashing up. But people chanting Abhidhava, Omito 4, they come down much quicker, much quicker than a group chanting Santa Claus. So which shows that religious chanting can work. Taking that religious, religious chanting can soothe emotional disturbances, taking that rationale. I apply that in my counseling session with a very faithful Christian client. The client has been struggling with a lot of uh, suicidal thoughts, a lot of uh, dysregulated emotions that make her want to stop it. That's why she want to hurt herself. As she is a Christian and she read the Bible, so we go into the Bible and we find like any statement, any kind of a, a paragraph or words that she really resonates with. When she reads, it actually helps her have a soothing, being loved feeling that can help her calm down. We just take one sentence and we use a chanting way to keep on repeating that statement. And I invited her to try in session, see if actually help her cope with strong emotionality, and it worked. And I assigned homework to have her chant that particular statement again and again, again and again. And after that, she is able to use that coping mechanism to soothe her mind. So if the client is not Buddhist, I don't need to use any Buddhist terms and means. When I want to share something that is about Buddhism, I always ask for permission. But the rationale itself is basically mindfulness, which taught us when our mind can be concentrated or sustainably focused on certain kind of object of meditation again and again, when it happened, our other disturbing thoughts or emotions will subside. So using that Buddhist rationale, I package and market it into a Christian way, and it worked. As long as mundanely she is happy, she is functional, then the Buddhist counselor task is okay. So this is this is what happened. You don't have to be a Buddhist in in a client as Buddhist counselor. You only need to be okay about a philosophy and teaching in Buddhism, such as CBT. We come from Stoicism. You don't need to understand Stoicism. You don't need to worship any Stoic philosopher. You just feel that the philosophy is okay. And you don't have to worship or, or, or do anything uh, religious and it can still work. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Uh, moving to another question. Uh, Xiaowen writes, thank you both for this wonderful dialogue. Thank you. I was greatly inspired. I am just wondering if both of you would like to comment more on the function of seeing in Buddhism, particularly in relation to the object of the act of seeing. So I guess the thing that is being viewed. How does that function help deliver the I that is seeing or the I, the self, out of daily suffering, if possible? And will there be any impact of seeing on the object itself? That's a, that gets us to our fun interdependence uh, Pachika Samupada discussion, if you want to go that way, Dr. Lee. Uh, if I would uh, were to answer this question from a kind of Buddhist studies scholar's point of view, it's that, yes, there is an understanding that the object, the I, and the consciousness that has that sensory perception, that they're all connected, so that your encounter with the outside world requires objects but it also requires your embodied self. It requires the ability to see, and it requires a consciousness to filter and interpret that information. At any 
point in that sensory perception process, uh, a mindfulness-based model says that we can note what's happening, understand what's happening, even if it's in this moment that comes just after that sense perception occurs. So how do we deliver ourselves from this? from ourselves and our eyes? Well, one, might, one way might be to understand that the object doesn't exist independent of me, and I don't exist independent of the object, that this is a whole, and perhaps there is a soothing function to understanding myself in sophisticated, interwoven relationship with the world beyond myself. So that's just one, one answer, Dr. Lee. Oh, this is a very interesting question. Like Dr. Ming said, um, when we see something, we have object that is seeable. We have the eye consciousness that attend to it, and we have an eye organ. When that merge, we have a contact. When there's contact, we give right to perception, right? Give our perception to recognize what it is. And then we have the examination, the vitaka, vichara, those kind of things, and think more about it, and then we have concept of proliferation and go all the way to endless world of different realities, like Dr. Strange. But um, to unpack all that, I actually think one very important implication is we don't just see things directly. We many times see our interpretation of things. And our interpretation is updatable, just like iPhone. It can be from number one to number 14. It can be from something less skillful to more skillful. So every time when we have certain kind of uh, something suffering, something emotional disturbing, something that upset you, it's usually we are attached to an interpretation or a view, a ditty. Our view. When we are too attached to a certain kind of view, it hurts us. But the teaching of how we may not see the reality of things liberate a little bit because our interpretation would not be the only way to see reality. The reason why we hold on to a certain kind of interpretation of view is actually, like you said, is driven from the I from an eye relation. So let me ask you, Xiao Yun, say like if you have a class or have a group of colleagues or friends and you take a group picture and people send it back to you, who is usually the first person that you look at? Yourself, right? Yes. Or like someone you're interested in. Yes, right? So when you do that, we are not seeing things as it is. Because of how we have an eye relation, the eye centeredness, we are narrowed and limited in our way to view reality. Using that thing that narrowed the view to view the picture, we only see what we want to see. Or sometimes we only see what we don't want to see and ignore all other things. So that teaching, I think it reminds us again and again of well, okay, when I'm upset, when I'm suffering, am I actually holding on to just one perspective? Do I have to just hold on this perspective? Or when I examine why we are holding on to that perspective, what does it mean? Why is my mind doing that? Is that a way that I try to subconsciously satisfy some of my needs? Like, did I have a good makeup? Did I feel the work or do my uh, uh, pimples like grow out to satisfy my attachment to body or something like that? So all that is not about right or wrong. It's about can we use each process as a lesson to learn better of how can I take that as a way to liberate from more suffering? So in summary, all we see basically is from interpretation. Intervention is to know that, to note, ah, this is my interpretation. To know my interpretation may be something written from I. So I choose to entertain different perspectives. Ah, to look at 
wow, like John that day has a nice shoes, or Mary that day actually, oh, didn't do her makeup or something like that, to see more different reality. Once we are able to entertain more perspective, including what other people think of the same thing, we are usually less attached to only one perspective. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, please continue to post them. And I've caught my eye on the chat and the Q&A uh, dialogue box. Uh, coming to a different sort of question, one that um, brings us back uh, to the book. And this is your target uh, or one of your targets, which are uh, professional counselors themselves. Uh, and I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about how you direct the book to address that particular audience? Thank you. I love that question. And if um, in this real time, I'm sorry, like in Buddhism, we usually don't talk about time and no real time, right? But in this real time, if you are counselor or interested in pursuing career, or later, if anyone here in this recording, I really hope to make one very important point, not just about this book, but about the benefits of Buddhism. For me, I studied two professional programs, taught in about three professional programs. And most of the time, your professors do not teach you a lot about self-care, self-cultivation. They can be very nice, very kind, but no one really emphasizes on the importance of if you want to make people happy, you need to be a happy person. You need to be kind to yourself. You need to appreciate yourself. You need to think yourself. You need to understand where are your limits. You need to understand how you can reasonably live a happier life and allow yourself to be happy. Allowing yourself to be happy is actually very, very important. Or even being happy for minor things, unconditional things, without special reasons. Once you're able to do that, your counseling career can go a much longer way. One thing I learned from Buddhism is because it's like if you just rely on intellect, you just rely on some skills and thought that you can talk to people, guide them a certain way or share something and they will feel better. It may work to a certain extent. It still works, but to a certain extent. But what changes people is actually the human connection. And the human connection comes from genuinely who you are. Not that simple. Who you are as, how much do you know about yourself? how comfortable you are with being yourself. Are you able to care for yourself so that you are happy, you are kind, you are grateful when you see a client and the energy through your interaction with your client can come across and guide them with this positive role model or different way of living. In this book, speaking to the Buddhist counselors or any kind of counselors or mental health professionals, of course, it is, my, it is my wish, it is my target to show you, ah, Buddhism can actually be a theoretical orientation. Nice. I don't need to just rely on something that is Western or something that I don't resonate with. If I resonate with Buddhism, I can learn something to supplement my practice. This is important. But even more important is, I wish all of you can start with loving more of yourself. Treat yourself. As if, as if how you treat your important clients. Many times we don't do that. It's a skillful selfishness. Just my belief that before we can let go or relinquish from my attachment to self, we need to care for ourselves. We need to understand it well. And at some point, we really realize that, aha, okay, after doing so much, there's still some suffering holding onto the self. And finally, you can let it go. But it's not something that you can skip to let go of self. Or else it will be just denying, rejecting something ultimately important. 
So to all the counselors, it sounds very cliche, but I still have to say it. Happy counselors, happy client. Uh, speaking of friendliness and loving kindness, we have a question from uh, Mitra Barua, who is um, interested to learn more about the potential pitfalls of an anatta or a no-self worldview behind Buddhist counseling. Uh, he asks, do you see any danger or unhelpful uh, unhelpfulness in employing the Buddhist theory of no-self anatta in counseling, given that it is a very complex uh, concept and could easily be misunderstood? Great question. Actually, it's self-answered. The danger is being misunderstood, right? So, so many times that when we talk about non-self, people would go to, this, to the extreme of annihilation, denying, rejecting uh, the self and thought that self doesn't exist or I don't have to exist this way. I think for Buddhist counselors, for people who practice Buddhism, the first criteria is to understand the Buddhist teaching to at least to a fundamental level to understand what may non-self be looking like. And if we understand at least conceptually what is anatta, we will not force our client to deny itself. Like I said, it's a sequential process. The ultimate direction is towards the anatta, but this is something with a lot of cultivation, with a lot of uh, uh, graduate training we can do. But the very beginning is actually to be aware of the self, to know how self is like, to choose to care for it, love it, being compassionate to it. And bit by bit, we can progress into let go more of it, be more flexible about it, be less rigid about it, and finally reaching a non-self. This is very important, sequentially important. Instead of client coming in, I did actually see a psychologist talking to a client, in a, my perspective will be easily misleading way of non-self. There was a clinical psychologist working in a hospital setting. One of his jobs is to talk to client who discovered certain kind of terminal cancer. So the psychologist see the client coming, the client said with sadness, denial, anger about how suddenly develop a very bad cancer and cannot really accept that. And a psychologist answer was, well, I don't want you to take a, make a big deal out of that. It's not as, in, as important as you think. I, I don't think you need to care so much about it. It's, it's okay. Those kind of way to try to convince client of a non-self. This is not skillful. It shouldn't be this way. It should be attuning with the feelings of the client. We should not come from perspective of we are more superior. I know what is non-self or you don't. So I have forced my understanding to you. We should always attune with where they are, why are they suffering, seeing from their perspective, what is going on. And sometimes it may mean we are not seeing something super skillful. We are just being there with them to listen to their suffering. This may be the most skillful thing that can happen in one moment. So, all those are based on, first, our study of Buddhism, and second, with clinical experiences about human nature. If we want to bring someone to a more super mundane level, we cannot leave the mundane level. We always start with the mundane level and here and there, skillfully see in what way we can actually do something to ease the clinging to certain kind of concepts or self a little bit. Just like when you read the suttas, how many ways the Buddha was able to teach the same concept to different people? Limitless, right? My assumption is that the Buddha is very skillful in understanding how do I talk to you to make you particularly understand something? Well, all the people may not understand when they hear the same dialogue, but you understand. So this is a result of our own cultivation so that we can be more so-called skillful, flexible in disseminating the same concepts to different people in a very different way. So the tailor-making to making that specific 
understanding happen. Yeah. Thank you so much and thank you for your question. Uh, following up on a concern from the other side, which is uh, in our question from Matthew. What are the main differences between cognitive science or the assumptions of, of cognitive science and early Buddhist psychology? Which aspects of cognitive science are incompatible, don't work with Buddhism? Um, this is a really big question because the definition of cognitive science or different aspects of cognitive science and Buddhist psychology, expert Buddhist psychology, there are many different definitions. I would just try to say what I think. So cognitive sciences, one thing that is compatible is I think it talks a lot about mental representation, that everyone has a idiosyncratic subjective perspective of things that may actually be different than other people. And it's okay. And cognitive science also talk about different kind of illusions. Sometimes when we are in entertainment, like uh, we see pictures of how come this person is smaller, that person is bigger, but in the same room, like those kind of cognitive illusions and all those kind of things, which is somewhat, in a way, parallel to some Buddhist concepts. What we see are actually our interpretation, which may not reflect reality. But if you talk about the incompatible side, I think the main thing I need to iterate again is the assumption of the I-ness, the I relation to everything. Cognitive science, from my understanding, it still comes from how using the I to see the world. Buddhism understands that perspective, but it's not about studying how I see the world, but about how I see the world that makes me suffer and how I see the world can make me liberate from suffering. And if that's the way, practice towards it. I think that i -ness is an important concept to differentiate it too. And the other thing is, when I think about, when I compare and contrast those kind of concepts, many times I find some similarity. And I think it's reasonable. If you have heard about the ancient Indian story of blind man touching an elephant, we are all touching an elephant, but we find something different. Oh, that's a pillar. Actually, that's feet. Ah, that's a weave, and actually, that's a tail. We are touching the same thing, sometimes similar, sometimes different, because the human mind is still the human mind. If you use a cognitive science perspective or Buddhist perspective, still the same human mind. So there must be ways that are compatible. But I think what I like about Buddhism is the advancement towards non-self. What we are talking about, in a way, is actually meaningless. It doesn't really matter because it may not help with our liberation of suffering. So all the conversation, all the advancement that science does, only the part that can help to liberate from suffering is important. Others is entertaining. It can feed certain kind of egoistic needs. It can bring you mundanely, oh, okay, knowledge or prestige or money. It can feed to the conceptual proliferation. But if it's not germane to liberation from suffering, it's actually not important. The highness and this part, only liberation from suffering is important. I think it's in another incompatible part between cognitive science and Buddhism. Of course, if we go deep, there can be different kind of uh, uh, more detailed comparison. But for this level, I will stay with these two parts as I hope to respect the lineage in early Buddhist teaching. Thank you again, Dr. Lee, for your uh, answer. And thank you to our audience uh, for these great questions. Thinking a little bit, uh, now that you've described the model, you've talked a little bit about uh, specific cases, experiences, you've uh, spoken about religion and science. Um, now I'd like to shift gears to think about harder situations. So for example, um, there are lots of mental states, emotional states, where 
a client, a person can't engage with the note, no, and choose model because, for example, their executive function is impaired, their bodily health is impaired, hmm. awareness, uh, intrusive emotions, they, they, uh, things, all kinds of different parts of what's necessary for a person to be in order to engage in the practice might be impaired. So what happens? What is the approach in those kinds of situations in the model uh, that you're bringing together? Hmm. This is a very good question. You know, any kind of psychotherapy or any kind of Buddhist practice, I would say there are limitations. So just now Dr. Main talked about certain kind of situations like executive functioning impairment. For example, someone suffering from psychotic symptoms, schizophrenia, they cannot really contemplate or reflect on certain kind of things logically. Or people have a severe um, situation of depression that they may not be able to have the motivation to cultivate their mind to practice. In that situation, the first thing that we think about is always about risk assessment. Is the client safe? Would the client be healthy, like reasonably healthy and safe to continue treatment? If not, we may need to arrange something else or hospitalization or refer to a psychiatrist. Secondly, are there situations that we need to have psychiatrist to evaluate and provide medication? And with the medication, if the person can focus better, understand better, have a higher functional executive functioning so that they can try different ways of uh, no, no choose or other Buddhist practices, that would be better. And in a, a little less extreme situations, I also encounter some clients uh, that are at clinical level, but at the same time, uh, their organic part, organic like neuroscience, organic means like brain and all that, like seems to be intact and functional. It's just the emotionality too strong that disturb them from focusing and cognitively functioning. Those situations, starting from notes, the first step is to help them find one of the ways at least to foster a mindful haven or my master called spiritual oasis, which is a certain kind of practice to help them calm and soothe their mind. This is almost one of the first steps in most of the sessions that I did. Traditional Buddhist practice, from my understanding, it, it, of course, there are a lot of different range from regular sitting meditation to a Satipatthana 24 hour cultivation is possible too, right? Because it's, cultivation is not just reaching jhana. You are not reaching jhana 24 hours a day, but in daily activities, it's all about cultivating our mind in anything any situation but regular buddhist practice uh i uh, my understanding is that sitting meditation in a committed way is a common norm the time the sessions it can differentiate for different people different commitment different availability but very rare that if you go to a uh, uh, buddhist practice master they ask you don't meditate or don't do chanting there must be some regular practices but when we do that use that mindset to work with client i would try more different things such as if sitting meditation do not work the person have too many disturbing thoughts when they sit down they just become more aware of the haunting daunting thoughts i do not do that my role or my, my habits is from something strong to something mild. Something strong means that you need to actively engage in the activities. Mindful eating, mindful walking, mindful listening, or like drawing. Certain kind of uh, activities that is peaceful and sustainably the person can actively engage the mind again and again while doing that, soothing their emotions. Plus, 
influenced by positive psychology, something that they find joy in, something that they find pleasurable. And when they do it, it doesn't exhaust their mind. When you ask people, what do you like to do? They may say, I like to uh, watch a soap opera marathon on Netflix or spicy hot pot. Certain kind of dramatic, strong, uh, pleasant feelings that distract their mind and they like that. But in Buddhist counseling, we find those more peaceful, pleasant, sustainable practices to concentrate their mind. Some clients that I have, like chanting would be one, or if not, joy, mindful joy, uh, music. Uh, some clients that they actually like music, either mindfully listening or composing music. And for um, some other clients, it can be some physical exercise, yoga, doing that with them in a the session, teaching them how to be attentive to their body, to their breath. Very importantly, they need to find it useful in the session. And then that can motivate, reinforce them to do that outside of the sessions. Or some other extreme situations that I do with client is there was a time I played basketball with a client. There was a time that it was an adventurous therapy with a client consent, uh, having a punching bag <laughs> to punch. <laughs> Strong punch, release certain kind of tension, mindfully moving punching, and then doing sitting meditation. There are a lot of possible skillful ways and every person can benefit from something very different. But I think when the mind is too disturbed, we need to find something stronger, more physical, coming back to the body to release certain kind of tension, emotions, and then come back to tranquility. And when clients know that it can work, client, I mean, we can be client too. People have wisdom when they know it works it can be more sustainably applied to their life so that it can start with at least a few minutes a day, an undisturbed time in their life. They can disengage from all the emotions, all the problems. And that haven or oasis is very meaningful. As long as they have one minute, they can have two, can have five, up to 15. And then that experience is a change to their life because they find hope again oh i realized that i don't have to be anxious all day oh there could be a break in my depression this is actually one of the very early steps for people to realize impermanence so many times for dr main's situations that they get discussed people who have those kind of strong problems with executive functionings or emotional disturbance it's easy for them to develop a view of seeing permanence in impermanence, meaning that my disorder, my condition is forever. It cannot change. Yeah, it can change to getting worse. Well, like in those kind of situations that we try to work with clients, being with them, attentive, focusing, mindfully, it breaks their clinging to view to realize that, oh, it's not as permanent as I think. That is actually one of the very important starting points. When they can do that to tranquilize their mind, we can do something to know and choose, know and choose. From behavioral to cognitive, from strong to mild. So those are my tricks. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start to bring our discussion to a close. So if you have any last questions, uh, please do post them. Uh, this one, this question's a fun one. So hopefully you'll enjoy yourself with it. Uh, if you could pick a hero from both sides. So if you could pick one hero and tell us why they're your hero from psychology oh. and then a hero from Buddhism and tell us why they're your hero. Uh, please, please do so. Yes. Well, if I would pick a hero from psychology, the first one coming to mind is actually Carl Rogers. Of course, he's not a Buddhist. But what is that? The unconditional positive regard is so much like compassion. Well, something he said is like, 
when I look at a person, I don't judge, I don't criticize, because it's just like when I look at a sunset, I wouldn't say, ah, like that part should be more orange, that part should be more red, it should be slower, faster. I just sit back and attentively enjoy the sunset and see the beauty of that. I think that's very compassionate. And from my understanding of his position in the history of psychotherapy, he is one of the most humane, kind person that changed the field and set a tone that psychologists are not that like dressing like this, solemn and serious and sitting back. Tell me about your mother. Mm -hmm. Like not like that, right? We should care. We should use our heart to connect with other people. Most powerful intervention is human connection. Even in Buddhism, uh, the master and disciples connection, the Buddha with all the Bhikkhu and Bhikkhunis connection. And what do we know about spiritual friendship? The Kainamitta, we know that without them, it's like losing the whole practice. They are actually all of the practices. It's all coming back to human connection. So Carl Rogers will be my hero in psychology. Um, I think in Buddhism, well, um, I, I sorry that I, I I don't I don't know the name in English, but Xuan Zhuang, like the the Chinese Buddhist monk, going all the way to the West, and you know the Monkey King and all the things that protected him. He is not just a hero of bringing back all the suttas for the translation, and it's not just how well versed he is in the language, in the interpretation, his ability to articulate all the teachings and win all those debates, but how adamant he is, how committed he is, how being just a regular person can pass through all the challenges to go to the West and get something valuable because he has a strong compassion and passion attached to it. And that's why we can advance on our Chinese Buddhism. And to be honest, my master, Venerable Hin Hong, in the Center of Buddhist Studies, every time when I complain to him about how come it's so difficult, how come there are so many problems in academia, how come like people in academia cannot be more pure, kind, educational people that is working for the greater good, but those kind of questions that Dr. Main would know that is not important questions. <laughs> and he would always come back to think about Master Xuan Zhuang. If not for him, then what would we get? his adamant, his ability to persevere, those are the things that we should work through. And we need to believe in all those kind of challenges. It's just part of the process that make us grow and be stronger. And one day, if we continue and focus, we will realize what we want to do. So those two are my big heroes in Buddhism and psychology. Thank you for that. And uh, my last question. Uh, for the day, which I will hold for a moment because I see that a new one has come in. Uh, Louise is asking a follow-up. And uh, she writes, totally agree with Dr. Lee. When I suffer from serious illness, it's actually depressing when my friend or my doctor trying to make me feel better tells me not to think about my illness or tells me that there are people who have more serious illnesses than you. <laughs> Uh, so this is uh, following up that uh, this kind yes. of uh, advice or statement from uh, healthcare practitioners can be very difficult. I can say that many people out of kindness, they try to say things to make others feel better, but from the receiver's end, it actually makes us feel that they don't understand. I wish that they can just listen. I wish that they can attune to my pain and let me know that I'm not weird. I'm let me know that I'm not abnormal. I'm just a regular person suffering. And to be honest, I think um, one way that I want to say to you now is that yes, we all suffer. I also suffer from depression. A few two times in my life, I think I wouldn't know exactly your story and your feelings but I know that it sucks sometimes that no one can understand. I hope that you know, no matter what happened, 
there can be hope. I know that it doesn't sound like it, but sometimes it's really about certain kind of choices that we make. In reality, there's so many things we cannot choose. Our aimless or strong emotions coming up, our family, our partners, and all that. But it always reminds me of uh, one line that I saw from a movie, which is about a man who get a serious accident and have to spend the rest of his life on a wheelchair. And uh, a helper told him that you cannot decide whether you sit on a wheelchair, but you can decide on how to sit on it. So it, all, it reminds me of, yes, there are many struggles, many problems that we cannot just instantly change, like having a magic wand. But we can at least choose attitude to see it. Another thing is, it also sounds very cliche every time I say that, but I think it's very important. Can we actually be easier on ourselves, love ourselves, think ourselves, appreciate ourselves a little more? Because we cannot just wait for other people to do that. We cannot convince other people to love us the way that we want to be loved. But we can learn and practice to love ourselves the way that we ever wanted to be loved. And we can practice no matter how bad situations are. There can be moments that can allow ourselves to be happy. This moment, spending an evening with you guys. This moment, having a healthy body that we can all take a mindful breath. <sighs> Later, that we can still have dinner and enjoy the food bit by bit when we are able to cultivate more unconditional happiness it can become a good protective factor for ourselves. When we are able to love ourselves by being ourselves, letting ourselves to be happy, letting ourselves to be kind, then we can rejuvenate more connections with other people. I think those are some of the things that from my clinical experiences and from my own life with my struggles that I want to humbly share with you. Thank you so much. And this uh, brings you brings me to my last question for you of our evening tonight, which is, what does a practitioner of Buddhist counseling get to? What does their life look like? What is the positive outcome of working on yourself, working with clients, and uh, cultivating towards this model of no, note, no, and choose. This is a great question, also a difficult question. Part of it, life is life. There are conditions. Life with, or reality, one thing that, never, reality that would never disappoint us is that there will be always disappointment we can expect the fact that life has suffering. And sometimes there's not no things that we can change externally in the environment about suffering. But to be very honest, like my way of communicating with people is usually try to be candid. At this moment that we are talking, my mom actually suffers from leukemia. A few weeks back, there's a very severe level situation. And I struggle a lot of whether coming to the Canada to give the workshops. But my mother really wants me to go because of basically um, having a son being sat and crying next to her versus a son sharing something important, hopefully make people a little happier, smile a little happier. Of course, the later one is more skillful. I'm still sad about my father's situation. I still miss her. I still want her the best. But being a Buddhist counselor, at least it's easier for me to accept the fact that life is impermanent. Our important ones will die. And easier for me to accept the fact that my choices, many things that I do or ruminate or doubt about my decisions, doubt whether I've been a good son or uh, wishing my mother to be well and denying her illnesses would only bring us more suffering. So when I'm able to accept the limitations, to accept the reality, even though reality sometimes is suffering. I can see 
out of all the conditions, what may be a more skillful thing that I can do, at least at a mundane level? Accompanying my mother, talking to her more openly about that, asking her whether she want me to go or not want me to go, and using those kind of stories to share with you, life is valuable. Every moment is precious. So that in this life, we can take all the chances to upgrade our mind to be more skillful, and then we have less regrets. Bit by bit, I believe one day, culminating all the good merits, all the practices, then hopefully we can reach the liberation, or even being a Buddhist being helping more people. So in essence, yes, accepting the unchangeable things in life, hopefully radically accepting them, and knowing that denying it, fighting against it, distorting it, would only bring more suffering. For things that we can still change, be courageous, be compassionate, be committed to make the changes. And every time when there's a failure, when there's a problem, we know that this choice doesn't work. We know this is the problem. We know the reason why it doesn't work. So we readjust ourselves to make a skillful choice again and again, moment by moment, until we are more happy having less suffering again and again. Because we know that there are always chances in life, in our speech, in our mind, in our body. If we miss something, it's okay. There's always an next chance. So I guess this is part of the sharing of a life as a Buddhist counselor. And finally, of course, more love, more kindness to ourselves and for, and for other people. Wisdom or right view from my perspective is in any moment, any situation, what is the most kind decision for myself and others? This is actually one way of my mundane interpretation of right view. And just by that, bit by bit, we can cultivate much more um, our wisdom and loving kindness for ourselves and other people. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was wonderful. Uh, it was uh, my privilege to be your interlocutor tonight. Uh, I enjoyed myself thoroughly, uh, learned a lot. Uh, I hope audience uh, feels uh, similar. And I'd also like, uh, of course, to thank our generous author, scholar, counselor, uh, and uh, empathetic uh, joyful speaker tonight. Thank you so much for everything. I'd like to thank our uh, donor, uh, a family, the whole family who uh, sponsors the TLKY uh, Canada Society Temple, as well as our program here at UBC. The Robert H. Ho Family Foundation makes uh, so many of these events, uh, teaching undergraduates uh, about Buddhism at UBC, uh, holding uh, conferences and other kinds of outreach makes all of this possible. And it is my privilege to uh, help deliver uh, some of, of those events and uh, share them with you. Thanks to our departmental home, the Department of Asian Studies. And thank you so much to the TLKY Canada Society uh, Executive, to uh, Ernest Ung, and uh, to uh, Sandy Yip, who uh, both of whom worked very hard on simultaneous interpretation into Mandarin and Cantonese this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all for us tonight. Uh, please take care of yourselves and we hope to see you again in the future. Bye. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you.